So again, I'm Paul. Um, I work at the US, there's a USGS lab in, Maryland, in uh, Washington called the Merrill Submarine Field Station. Uh, that's where I work. Uh, we're on the island in Puget Sound. Um, it's actually an old uh, lighthouse uh, station on the northern coast of the island. And uh, I you, actually, I have a picture of the lab here. This is the lab right here. Um, this is not Baker's background. This is Admiralty Inlet, which is a northern inlet to Puget Sound. So Puget Sound essentially starts here and goes south to Seattle. And we're really a disease ecology research lab. Uh, we're interested in understanding how diseases impact populations of wild green fish. And uh, really, uh, the host and the pathogen are inconsequential to us. Um, but with that said, our, our model system that we usually use uh, is herring. Uh, for several reasons. Herring have a lot of bugs, and uh, we've developed colonies of pathogen-free herring that we use as test animals in the lab. Um, the approach we use is basically a three-tiered approach. Uh, it starts with infection and disease surveillances, it's essentially uh, doing surveys of wild fish uh, in the wild, um, both in Puget Sound, up through PC and, and into Alaska now. Um, and secondly, and very importantly, um, this is where our approach differs from that which has been done in the past, is that we try to develop these empirical disease relationships. So we have colonies of lab rats, if you will, in, in our lab. They're pathogen-free herring that we use for disease challenge work. And uh, it's a, essentially a reductionistic approach. So we, we remove every variable except the one variable that we want to test. And uh, using this approach, we can get at very slow baby steps in terms of understanding the disease processes. Uh, once we understand these relationships, we use those relationships to try to develop pr uh, predictive tools that forecast disease potential. And I'll walk you through some of these um, presentation here. So, a quote from Conrad Lorenz, uh, the great behavioral ecologist. And uh, when he said this, um, I'm pretty sure he was thinking of herring, because herring really are buggy fish. Um, they have a lot of pathogens. Uh, we, we work with three primarily, and those are the three most pathogenic bugs that are in herring. But there's dozens of pathogens in herring. There's coccidians, there's nematodes, the herring worms that you see all the time, um, trematodes, uh, sea lice. Um, but if you narrow it down to the three most pathogenic, those are the ones that I'm going to talk about here. The first is EHS, or viral hemorrhagic septicemia. Causes these hemorrhages around the mouth, uh, the eyes, uh, sometimes around the base of the pins. And it's quite virulent. Uh, it kills herring very quickly um, in the order of days. Um, so after exposure, we're looking at five, seven days for mortality to start. The other bug we work with in herring is ichthyphonus. Uh, the disease is called ichthyphoniasis or ichthyphonus disease. Uh, in herring, at least in juvenile herring, uh, it manifests as these sort of black spots on the flank. And uh, the third disease that I'm not going to talk too much about today is called viral erythrocytic necrosis, or VEN. And this essentially uh, really reduces the fitness of the herring by lysing all the red blood cells. Uh, so this is a normal healthy herring on the bottom, very nice red gills. Uh, this is a, a herring, believe it or not, this fish was alive when we sampled it. Um, the hematocrit in this healthy herring is about 45%, that's, and the hematocrit in this fish is about 5%. So the fish is severely anemic. Um, and in the wild, this fish won't live very long. Um, but what I want to focus on today are some of the epidemiological principles surrounding these two diseases here. First, again, is VHS. And the way we're starting to understand the way this disease works is through a series of principles. And I want to talk about five main principles that govern the epidemiology of VHS in hearing. Uh, the first, uh, Pacific herring are highly susceptible to VHS. So if we look at a mortality curve here, we have mortality on this axis, days after exposure on this axis. So herring were exposed to the virus here on day zero. They go through this classic mortality curve after about three weeks, 60% uh, mortality. And these were these were herring eggs that we had from Prince William Sound. We were raised in our lab under specific pathogen-free conditions. So these Prince William Sound herring were susceptible. Uh, we've also done this the same thing with other stocks of herring. Uh, this is a different stock from Puget Sound, happens to be from Sherry Point. Uh, same mortality pattern. Uh, another stock, another genetic stock from Puget Sound, since you're from Sarver, again, the same mortality pattern. So it doesn't really matter which genetic stock of herring you use, they all are equally susceptible to this particular disease. And this cumulative mortality can go up, it can go down, it all depends on the conditions that are involved at the time of the challenge. 
Okay, so as evidence of this high susceptibility of herring uh, to VHS, we see these recurring epizootics and fish kills of herring, especially in British Columbia. Uh, these sorts of fish kills are reported almost on an annual basis in British Columbia, especially on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Uh, this one happened to be in sardines, uh, but there were herring involved in this epizootic. Uh, we see epizootics in, in herring, sardines, sand lance, uh, shanker perch. So it does kill wild fish uh, in the Northeast Pacific. Principle number two, uh, VHS is perpetuated covertly in populations of wild Pacific herring. And what I mean by that is if we go out to a school of herring like this or a school of sand lands, and we dip into this school with a dip net and we sample 60 fish, they're all negative. They're all negative for the virus. But if we take several thousand of these fish, bring them back to the lab, and put them in a tank, and we subsample fish out of this tank on days after we've, after we've been put in there, we, we get this pattern. So here we have mortality here, or I'm sorry, prevalence of the disease, and confinement time in the tank. So on day zero, these fish just came out of Puget Sound. Um, and again, none of them were positive. But within one day after being in this tank, we've done nothing else with them other than capture them and put them in the tank. They start to break with VHS. We get about 30% with the disease. Increases to about 95% here after about a week. Then the fish die or they recover and, and sort of the epizootic sort of tails off. But this is what I mean by it's perpetuated covertly, where if you go out and do a 60 fish sample, you very rarely find this particular disease, uh, but it's in the population at a very low level. And one of the mechanisms that it perpetuates covertly is in the brain. Um, this particular virus is a rhabdovirus in the same family as rabies. Uh, one of the characteristics of rhabdoviruses is that they develop a neurotrophic form. They go towards the neural tissues. Um, so this is a, a section of a thin section of the brain here, and all these red areas are selective staining for VHS virus. So you can see the virus is essentially staining in the uh, in the brain. Uh, this is a peripheral nerve here, and all this red stuff around the peripheral nerve is virus. So the virus does have a tropism for neural tissues. And this is how we think it's perpetuating in here. Um, if you look at the virus in these neural tissues after exposure, so here we have weeks after exposure here, going out to a half a year, uh, 25, 26 weeks uh, post-exposure, and prevalence in the brain. After six months, we're still picking up virus in the brain of these fish and survive it. So it's a mechanism whereby it's, it's staying in the fish, perpetuating. Okay, the third principle of VHS is that these epizootics that we see periodically are initiated, are certainly initiated, and they're perpetuated by high levels of viral shedding from these fish. So here we have the amount of virus shed per fish per day after they've been exposed. Here they were exposed to about 10 virus particles per milliliter uh, on day zero. I don't have it on here. And by day five, we start seeing virus shed from these fish into the water. And by day 10, we get a peak viral shedding of 500 million virus particles shed per herring per day. These are extremely, extremely high viral shedding rates, uh, especially considering that we can initiate infections with one with a single virus particle. So one fish can really light off a school if it's shedding, um, if it's shedding these levels of virus. Uh, there's some pretty serious implications for this, and we think this is the reason why we see these herring break with VHS when we put them in tanks. There only takes one fish in that tank to be shedding to infect all its other cohorts. And one of the serious implications would be impounding herring. Uh, say in the spawn and felt fishery, and in Puget Sound, we, we impound herring for the herring uh, bait fisheries, herring bait fisheries as well. So you're all familiar with this. You get the rolling kelp uh, in a net pen, put herring from a seine into the net pen and in several days you get uh, egg layers on top of the kelp. But what happens is you put these fish in the net pen and under certain conditions, uh, what, if there's one positive fish in here and he's shedding that level of virus, these fish break with the virus. And indeed we saw that when we sampled these net pens several years ago. Um, when the fish were put into the net pen, very little problems with the virus. Uh, by day six, nearly 100% of the fish in the net pen were positive. Uh, the disease start to tail off by day eight. Uh, this is one pound, a second pound, and a third pound, and we saw the same thing in each of these pounds, um, where the virus physiologically went off inside the pounds. 
Um, again, we think this is caused by viral shedding. Um, here we have viral shedding in terms of virus particles per milliliter inside the net pen in the open circles. So we started to see shedding one day after the fish were added to the net pen. Uh, and then we had a big peak in viral shedding here in the open circle at about 750 virus particles per milliliter that we detected inside the net pen uh, when the fish were released on day eight. Uh, the black circles are three meters outside the net pen and that's on this axis. So when the, just before the fish were released, just over 200 PFUs or virus particles in, outside the net pen as well. Paul, can you test um, if an adult's been exposed in the past? Can you tell? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna talk about that. Okay. My next principle. <laughs> um, so we, um, during a peak for Nepozoatic, we can we can do some back in the middle of calculations to figure out how much virus is being produced in one of these net pens. So if you're looking at 57 to 228,000 fish in one of these net pens, uh, one of these pounds during a peak is going to produce 14 logs of virus per day. Um, I didn't know the volume of Prince William Sound, but I, I did find the volume of Puget Sound. It's 26 and a half cubic miles. Um, so this amount of virus spread equally over all of Puget Sound is essentially one virus per liter of all of Puget Sound water. Um, so one net pen can actually produce a whole lot of virus. What I'm trying to get at. Uh, the fourth principle: uh, host and environmental factors uh, influence uh, VHS epizootics. Uh, in terms of environmental factors, temperature is critical. In particular, cold temperature. So here we have cumulative mortality, uh, days post exposure. Uh, at cold temperatures, uh, here just shy of 90 degrees, we're seeing almost 90% mortality. Uh, drop the temperature to 11, and it's about 40% mortality. Drop the temperature, to, or in, sorry, increase the temperature to 14, and the mortality drops even more. Sorry, try it back. Um, in addition to mortality, uh, temperature also affects uh, the shedding rates of these fish. So at the cold temperature. We had peak shedding here about 10 days uh, post exposure. At the warmer temperature, the peak was a few days earlier and the magnitude was much lower. And at the warmest temperature, the peak was again a day earlier and a lower, and, and a lower magnitude. So the question now is, you know, what, what, what's, what's the, oh, let me go with one more thing here. Uh, the persistence of the virus is also influenced uh, by temperature. So here we have the persistence in the brain at cold temperature nearly 70% of the, of the fish were still positive after 23 days. This is in the kidney spleen, it's slightly lower. Uh, at the warmer temperature at ambient, uh, much lower prevalence in the brain and in the kidney and spleen, and none of the fish, none of the fish were positive after 23 days in the warm temperature. So this begs the question, really, what's the driver of, of, of this um, temperature phenomenon? And it really goes back to the immune response of the fish. So we looked at this particular gene in herring is called the MX gene, and it influences, uh, it's, it's, it's a measure of the interferon response in herring. And interferon is essentially the antiviral response. So we measured the antiviral response. At cold temperature, the peak in this antiviral response uh, was at 10 days. Uh, the peak was at six days here, a little bit warmer. And the warmest temperature, the peak occurred two days after exposure. So we, we tend to think of, of this particular viral disease in the, in the host is an arms race between virus replication, how fast the virus can reproduce itself, and the host immune response. So if the host immune response gets ahead of it, it'll knock the virus replication down. And that's indeed what we're seeing here, where uh, at the warmer temperatures, we get this really strong antiviral response two days after exposure, knocks the virus down and prevents it from, from replicating. Whereas at, ten, at, uh, at the coldest temperatures, this response is much slower, so the virus replication wins the race. Okay, in terms of host actors, schooling <coughs> behavior is very important in terms of a driver of, of disease potential with VHS. Uh, in particular, if you look at things like this, like these bait balls, um, you come up on these and here you see the bait ball underwater, um, you get a little closer. Actually, I, think I have a video here to show. I have to click on it from back here. Yeah, now it's showing. So if you can imagine, 
if you, if you got one positive pairing in this school. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's a lot. Sorry. If you got one positive pairing in this school that's shedding virus, let me do this again. That's where the shark went into the camera and had to put it in the box. <laughs> <laughs> you like the blind leaving you blind back here. Oh, yeah. Let's try this again. It's in the background again. Oh, there it is. Okay, so if you've got one positive fish in there that's shedding virus, all his, all his cohort are swimming in that virus. And this is a re relatively small herring school. Some of the big balls, some of these are much larger in the order of meters and sometimes hundreds of meters. Um, sorry, I have to stop this before you get seasick. I'm really glad you can hear the audio. <laughs> I heard that word. <laughs> <laughs> I just, he's traumatized. Okay, so if, if there's one positive fish in there, we think that might be a mechanism whereby the virus is spread to all the other cohorts in the school, simply by the fish swimming over the water that we shed. Okay, th this principle we think is the most important principle for the epizootiology of VHS, and it's the principle of herd immunity. I hate to interrupt. Yeah. For the prior video, is it a stress response or is it just a... Um, no. Like if you have one that's infected, it's a stress response or just a proximity response? We think it's a, in a normal sort of shoaling hearing school where they're not very close together and they're just sort of always feeding. If there's one fish shedding virus, they're moving through that water so quickly and the, water, and the dilution level is so high that really they're, they're not seeing a whole lot of virus. But we're, when they're in close proximity, say in Bayman or Fjord, or a school where they're rolling on top of the same water for extended periods, then the exposure level is much higher. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not necessarily a stress response, just that there's one fish shedding, and it's like you're sitting next to your buddy in kindergarten and he's sneezing all day and you can't get away from him. <laughs> right. Okay, so herd immunity. Uh, we think is the most important principle of VHS. And here's how it works. So we have two groups of hearing here. Um, I was trying to use both hands and I had to take, <laughs> I had to take one of my hands off the remote. Oh, I got it. Okay. So we have two groups of hearing here. Uh, one is exposed to saline, uh, very low mortality. One is exposed to VHS, so you get this classic mortality curve. 60% mortality. Okay. Then at 40 day, 42 days post exposure, we, we break this group in half. So one, one group is again re exposed to saline. We get very little mortality. This is our control group. We get this group here that we expose the virus. We get exactly what we would have expected. They're susceptible, so they break the virus and die. When we re expose this group to DHS, they're completely refractory to the disease. They lived through it once before, they don't die anymore. We did this re-exposure of 42 days after the initial challenge. It doesn't matter if you do this four years after the initial challenge. They remain protected for life after they survive this initial exposure. We think this is the key concept for understanding uh, and forecasting these epizootics uh, in VHS. For example, if we could go sample a school of wild hearing and tell and tell you whether they subscribe to this uh, pattern, where they've seen the virus before and now they're completely refractory. There's nothing that we can do to this school of herring to initiate an epizootic. There's zero disease potential in this school. Conversely, if we can, if we can survey a school of herring and say it, does, it belongs to this life history characteristic, where it's never seen the virus before, it's still susceptible. Now we have disease potential. There's nothing we can do to this school of herring to make the disease. Okay, so now we've got this series of risk factors for VHS that we've developed. Um, here from a low disease potential on this side, the high disease potential. In terms of a source of virus, you have to have VHS carriers, either herring carriers or sand lance or sardines or some other fish that's positive in the vicinity to carry the virus. 
at that exposure. Herd immunity is critical. Um, if you've got previously exposed fish, there's a low disease potential. If you've got naive fish that have never seen it, there's a high disease potential. Temperature, colder temperatures with a higher disease potential. I didn't show these data, but diet is actually, we can, we can influence their susceptibility to the disease by, by giving them different diets. And this is what I was mentioning to Michelle. If you have a fish behavior in terms of shoals, loose aggregations like this have a lower disease potential than high aggregation schools like this, simply because of the dilution effect. And similarly, uh, geomorphology in terms of open water areas with high flushing rates, if you have shedding in those areas, the, water, the virus dilutes out. Uh, but if you have uh, a big school of herring in an embayment or a fjord with limited water exchange, uh, that shed virus can, can accumulate over time and eventually uh, build up enough to get uh, to an epizootic uh, level. So the question is now, how do we use these relationships to forecast potential for epizootics? And uh, what we're starting to do is develop tools that we can assign herring to each of those two different categories, low disease potential or high disease potential, and they're based on antibodies. So if we have here two groups of fish, uh, one that's naive to VHS, one that survived VHS, and we go in and we take blood out of each of these two fish, okay? Here's what we're doing down here, we're pulling blood out of the, out of the vein. And um, we take this blood and we spin it, and we separate out the cells, okay? And you take the plasma from the, from the fish, from each of these two groups. Okay. You take the plasma, and you take that plasma and you inject it back into naive hair. Okay? And then you give those, those, those injected herring a disease challenge. You show them the virus. You get this really cool response. Where, okay, this is a group now, this, this blue group. This is a group that receives serum from herring that survived DHS. They're completely refractory. So the serum had antibodies in it that were basically conferred to the new fish that you injected that into. Uh, the serum that came from the fish that never saw DHS, when that was injected into the herring, uh, and challenge. Uh, it didn't confer, it didn't confer any protection. So these fish were still susceptible. Um, so this is basically showing that we can passively immunize herring with the serum from, from survivors. So there's something in that serum fraction we think it's antibodies. And uh, the tool that we're now developing to assess these antibodies is a really interesting uh, immunological tool called plaque neutralization assay. So this is a standard uh, 24 wall plate. These are each wells that, that you can put stuff in. And if you put um, cells in each of these wells, these, these are standard cell lines that you can grow in the lab. And they, they, they eventually, they, they, they grow a monolayer of, of cells across the bottom of each of these wells. And if you just look at one of these wells here, blow it up, this is what the cells look like. They're actually skin tumor cells from a carp. Um, they grow, again, a monolayer. And if you put one VHS virus particle in this well, right here, it'll kill a cell, okay? And then eventually it'll replicate, it kills, it takes over the cell machinery, it replicates, it produces more virus. And after a couple of days, it kills the cells that are adjacent to that cell. And after about a week, you get this big hole in this monolayer, and this is called a plaque. So this is how we enumerate the amount of virus in anything, in, in, a, in a tissue, in water, or anything. So this, this, this well now has one virus in it. So if we were to put 10 viruses in here, we get 10 plaques. So you get 10 virus particles per whatever gram of tissue or whatever you put in here. And um, you can visualize these things really well because you get this, you, you, can, you can stain this purple, but the cells stain purple and the plaques don't stain at all. So you put this on basically a big flashlight and the light shines through the plaques, you can count them really easily. Okay, so now if you look at one of these channels here in that 24 well plate, if you look at the top well, here we've got 10, we put in a known amount of virus into this one. Ten virus particles we put in here. Now, if we take a, an aliquot of that ten, we've got an aliquot of virus now, a, a, a solution of, that, that each milliliter contains ten virus particles. If we take a milliliter of that out and we incubate it with plasma from herring that survived DHS, and say we dilute that plasma, say 20 fold. If there's antibodies in there, those antibodies will neutralize this virus. And what we'll get, well, what we'll get is a neutralization. And in this case, say we diluted the serum 1 to 20 and it neutralized 90% of the virus. It's a way to enumerate how much antibodies, how many antibodies were in 
plasma in the herring. Uh, so if we do a bigger dilution, so instead of 1 to 20, say we do a 1 to 80, there'll be fewer antibodies in there, and we'll get more plaques. So in this case, we had about five plaques, so about 50% neutralization at this 1 to 80 degrees. And if you do a bigger dilution of the, of the serum, you'll get more plaques that, that show up. If there were no antibodies to VHS in this serum, there would have been no neutralization, so we would have had 10 plaques all the way down the line here. So it's a really interesting and pretty efficient way now that we've got to quantify the amount of uh, antibodies that are in here. So this is what we're going to start to do, is we'll go to a school hearing like this and determine whether it subscribes to this history where it's seen the virus before. And we can tell because we can either do a passive immunization or we can do one of these serum neutralizations and if there's uh, high antibody levels in there, you know that they've seen it before and they're refractory. There's no way that the school is going to go through an antibody. Conversely, uh, if we, we can tell whether they, they subscribe to this history pattern where they've never seen the virus or highly susceptible, there's no antibodies. Uh, so in our serum test, we have no antibodies. But Paul, do you have to get that one that might be shedding? Or? No. So this is... Um, we would subsample a, a school or a population of herring, and um, if a certain proportion of them, we don't know what that proportion is, but if it's a, it's a concept in, in disease ecology called herd immunity, where if you have a certain proportion of your herd that's immune, it confers protection to the entire herd, to the entire school. So if we have a certain proportion of our herring population that's got these antibodies, we can assume then that the population is refractory. So yeah, we don't have to have. We don't have to find the virus. All we have to do is sample the blood, and we can tell whether they've seen it before or not. Paul, have you ever taken a batch of wild fish, toss them into the tank, and not have them break? Yes. So the occasionally you do hit a school that appears to be refractory. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and that's important because for things like the spawn on kelp fishery or a bait fishery, if we could provide answers like this real time, whether they're protected or not, it could conceivably give managers the yes or the no and say, okay, we've got refractory fish this year, do whatever you want with the local fishery. Or if we said, okay, this year your fish are susceptible, you might want to reconsider whether whether you really want to have a spawn and kelp fishery. switch gears a little bit and talk about Ichthyophonus. And uh, I put this, this um, quote from Hippocrates, uh, essentially the uh, founder of, of modern medicine up here uh, from this century BC. Now, I put this up here, this really old quote, essentially because this disease and this parasite has been known for a really, really long time. And we really don't know very much about it. So we're back to brass tacks in terms of trying to understand how the disease works in this particular, in this particular host. Uh, in herring, uh, the parasite Ichthyophonus first goes after the heart, and this is what we see. This is a really bad example here. This fish was this fish was alive. It was from Sitka, and the heart now is completely consumed with Ichthyophonus. Uh, after it goes, you can even see some spots here on the gills and a few on the liver here as well. Uh, this is what it looks like in the eyes of heart tissue here. <coughs> uh, these are the parasites here. Uh, these are called sky zones. Uh, this sort of wall here is a host immune response trying to encapsulate the parasite. Uh, more parasites over here and here. But it goes first from the heart, uh, then it eventually gets into the skeletal muscle. This is, excuse me, this is a chum salmon from Hokkaido. And these are ichthyphonus skyzons here in the, uh, in the cross section of the fillet. Um, this happens in herring as well, but you don't get this nice contrast between the pink flesh and the, and the white skyzons. So you got to look at it with some stains. Uh, but in herring here, this is the skeletal muscle down here, uh, the skin up here, uh, and these are the bonus uh, skyzons. They tend to have a tropism um, for the dark muscle around the lateral line in herring. Um, and then eventually these things burrow again from the heart uh, to the other internal organs, and they burrow from the inside of the fish out. They get to the, the skin of the fish, and they form these open ulcers where they release out into the water. But we're now referring to ichthyphonus as the most significant disease of wild marine fish in the world. Yeah, sure. So, sorry, no. so we do a lot of sampling for you, and we see a lot of that, like the last slide. Really? Yeah. Oops, 
So that's like, yeah. So if we weren't actually killing the fish and sampling fish, um, what is the possibility of that fish like surviving? Yeah, that's a great question. Because <laughs> we just did the experiment last week. No, oh, okay. No, because uh, no. we've always been curious. Because we yeah. do when we're sampling the fish and measuring them, and we always know like, oh, it clearly has like these lesions. Yeah. On the outside of the fish and stuff like that. I so would we've always been be, curious yeah. about like if if that fish was out in the population, how long would it survive with those lesions? Yeah, I don't know about a wild fish, but okay. I know the fish in the lab can survive with this for a really, really, really long time, like okay. at least six months. Um, now, certainly the, the, the condition of this fish is low, um, and they're probably, they're much, they don't swim as well, and they're more susceptible to predation. But the disease doesn't necessarily kill them when they look like this. Okay. Um, yeah, which was a surprise to us, because we were going to use this as a forecaster of or a, a mortality, where you can go look at a, count the number of these in a, in a population and say, OK, this number is going to die in the next month or two months. But that didn't happen. <laughs> These, these signs can persist for a really long time. Um, yeah, so yeah, we're calling it the most significant disease of wild marine fish in the world. And the reason we, we're calling it that is because there's this long history of recurring epizootics uh, with ichthyophonus and herring and other fishes all around the world. And you're really hard pressed to see any other disease in wild marine fish that has this sort of a history, a documented history of causing epizootics. Uh, we have Atlantic herring here off the Gulf of Maine, Gulf of St. Lawrence. Uh, over around uh, England. Um, this was a very large epizootic in the early 90s uh, in the uh, Kattegat, Scattergat regions of, of Denmark. Um, uh, there was another epizootic I don't have on here in 2010 in Iceland where they lost about 50% of their uh, adult carrying um, from the uh, But American Shad, Columbia River, Shem Salmon, and Yukon, um, it's a very significant disease of wild fish. I threw this up here. Don't don't look too closely at the, these prevalences here because they change from year to year. Uh, but what I wanted to show you here is that we've looked as far south as San Francisco Bay, it does not occur in Herring. And we've looked as far north as Bering Sea, it doesn't occur in Herring. But it does occur everywhere else in between. So we sort of bracketed the upper and the lower uh, uh, range of weekly bones in Herring. Okay, if you look at Prince William Sound, pre spawning adults. Um, the prevalence uh, from 2007 to 2014, anywhere from 42 to 21 percent. Again, don't lay too much credence on these particular prevalences. <coughs> the reason why is because, um, I'll show you the next graph, the prevalence, this is, these are the same data here, just broken out into size classes. So the prevalence of ICTI bonus each year increases with each size class of herring. So the youngest fish are the smallest prevalence, the oldest fish are the highest prevalence. And if you remember here, this 2010 data looked like it was pretty low. The reason this was low this year was because we, in 2010, we just didn't have any, we just didn't sample any big fish that year. Um, but each year we see this sort of pattern of increasing prevalence in each size class of fish. It didn't quite happen this year, and I think it's because there were only four fish here in the, the younger group and skewed, skewed a little bit. Um, we see some interesting patterns when we look at the data this way. These are, these are the data from Sitka. Um, same sort of thing, increased prevalence with, with size class. Um, but what you'll notice here, this is, this is an outlier. There's only one fish in this group this way. Looks like. um, what you will notice here, though, is that if you just look at the oldest, the, the largest fish here, the prevalence in Sitka and the oldest largest fish has been decreasing over the last eight years. And lower cook inlet here at Homer. Um, again, we saw this increased prevalence with, with size and age. And then all of a sudden, around 2008 or 2009, the prevalence dropped way off. Um, don't know exactly why this is, but we're getting close to that northern boundary of Vic Deep Bones and Herring up in the Bering Sea. Out there, but we, we wonder whether that northern boundary might go up and down a little bit uh, with ocean conditions. Okay, so those were in adults. If, if you look at the other side, remember we said the the lower prevalence in juvenile herring. And that's exactly what we see here. If you just look at Simpson Bay, uh, in the spring, the highest, we see prevalence as high as 15%. <coughs> and in the fall as well, around 0% when the new cohort came in. And by the following spring, that cohort would be up around 13%. So there was some exposure happening over winter uh, in the juveniles, but the prevalence never got all that high in juveniles. Now, there was an exception, and that was in Cordova Harbor. Um, this is 
in 2010, and we had a prevalence of 35% in juveniles. These are essentially one-year-olds in June. Uh, they're small one-year-olds. Uh, a high prevalence of 35%. We've never seen a prevalence this high in either age zero or age one hearing before. And um, it really begs the question, how do these fish become infected? And uh, it, it leads us to the bigger question of how do hearing become infected with the bonus? So we've known about this disease in hearing for over 100 years now, and we still don't know the answer to this very basic question. Um, and we're starting to get closer. One of the possibilities is that herring may become infected by eating infected offal from processing plants. Um, if here we have, this was a this was a project that one of our students did, um, and we essentially took infected herring, and they were euthanized, and they were then. Uh, let to rot for a number of days. So this is the days post rot here, post death in the hearing. And each day post rot, up to about 13 days post mortem, these fish were uh, fed out then to to uh, sculptors. Um, so on day zero, these are fresh herring that were fed, fresh infected herring that were fed to these sculptors. Uh, the material was infectious. The infectivity actually increased in herring that were allowed to rot for a day and fed out. Uh, to the sculptors. Uh, and hearing that we're rotting for five days, the material is still infectious. So uh, it appears as though dead t the herring does do quite well in dead tissue, and, uh, and it can infect at least sculptors uh, that have been fed uh, rotting tissue. Uh, just last week, we finished up another study where we acclimated herring to eating herring offal. So we got them eating herring tissues. and. Um, we fed them infected herring tissues every other day for a month, and by the end of that month, 95% of them were infected with the bonus. So, uh, it appears as though herring can get infected by eating infected offal. Whether that was the mechanism for Cordova Harbor or not, I don't know. Uh, but um, it is a plausible mechanism to explain how some herring, are, at least, are getting infected. Now, is that the big mechanism for how all herring, no three specific, are getting infected? Probably not. Um, there's probably a more natural mechanism that probably involves some sort of intermediate host, uh, perhaps one of these food items for herring. And this is where we're spending a lot of our attention right now. Um, this is not our hypothesis. This, is, this hypothesis has been around for, since at least the 1920s. But unfortunately, we haven't had the tools available to start screening zooplankton for the bonus until just recently. We started to develop these tools, and I'll show you what they are. Um, how do we diagnose it, Keith Bonus? Well, classically, we throw tissues into culture media. Um, and if there's one in Keith Bonus, the guy's not in there. It'll grow up after a week or two, and you'll see sort of this in culture. And uh, you see all these skies on scrotes really easy to, to detect. But the problem is we can't just throw copepods in the culture and expect to see this sort of thing, because this parasite is very pleomorphic. Uh, it has a lot of different faces. Um, so this is a classic form of the, of the parasite that we see. This is in liver tissue. Um, this is the parasite growing out of rotted tissue. It doesn't look anything like that. Um, this is a big thallus of the parasite. All these sort of hyphae have grown out of this one central schizont here. Um, and this looks like a big head of cauliflower. This is solid ichthyophonus here. Um, so depending on the culture conditions and how you look at it, it looks completely different. And our concern was that if we started screening wild zooplankton, we could easily see something like this or this and not even know that we were looking at ICP points. So we needed some new tools. Um, and we turned to molecular tools. So now we have a, both a conventional PCR and a quantitative PCR. Um, and we're going to start applying this to zooplankton to look for ICP points. Now the problem with using this exclusively is that if we get a positive, all we know is that we have that we have one gene of ICP bonus associated with that zooplankton. It doesn't necessarily mean that the the zooplankton was infected with ichthyophonus. bonus. So the parasite could have been in the water sample that was associated with the zooplankton. So we need some additional tools to back this up. And that's what we're working on right now. Um, classically, the way we, we look at ichthyophonus is with histology. And these are the parasite skies on here. They stain purple with this stain called PAS, or periodic acid shift. And uh, this is a great stain. It stains ichthyophonus really well. Um, but we developed this tool called the chromogenic in situ hybridization. And this tool is basically, it's a segment of uh, nucleotides. 
that binds complementary to a gene on ATP phonons, and it only binds to that section of gene on ATP phonons, it doesn't bind to anything else. And when it binds to ATP phonons, it lights up as its color. This is really important because, sorry, because we have things like this. PA, this is the traditional PAS stain, and this is a, the stomach of, uh, of a sculpin. And everything stains PAS positive. All this stuff, all these villi, everything in the inside of the, of the stomach stains PAS positive. So if there's ATP phonons in here, we'll never, we're not going to find it conclusively. If we run the in situ on this, boom, it just lights up. Um, you can see it here now that you know what you're looking for. It's right there. The other thing that this tool is good for is there's a lot of stuff out there that looks exactly like ATP phonons. In fact, these these are we got this slide from some researchers at Cornell. I said, hey, we found ATP phonons in, in this frog, and they published it. And um, we got a hold of their block, and we resectioned it, and ran the stitch on it, and it's not ATP phonons. So there's a lot of things out there that look like ATP phonons that we wouldn't have been able to tell apart if we didn't have this tool. And there's a lot of stages of ATP phonons that we wouldn't have recognized uh, if we didn't have this tool. So now we're ready to move through with a two-part step uh, for screens opening. And first, we're going to do a broad screen with these molecular tools. If we come up with a positive, we'll follow up with this uh, chromogenic in situ hybridization tool to find out exactly where it is and what it looks like. So, 100 years later, we finally have the tools to start doing this. <laughs> okay, uh, summarize here, uh, several pathogens do occur from Sphinx on hearing in throughout the Northeast Pacific. Under typical and zoonotic conditions, these pathogens occur in the near absence of observable, observable host mortality. Uh, these can occur either in high prevalence, such as what we see with ICP bonus, or they can occur in low prevalence, which is what we see with VHS. Um, but in the case of this low prevalence of VHS, it can turn into a high prevalence and high intensity disease situation pretty quickly. Epizootics and the company host mortality occur in response to changing host and environmental conditions. And we believe that the key to understanding, forecasting, and mitigating these diseases lies in the basic understanding of their epizootological principles. And I threw this slide in here. This is I took in Sitka last year uh, when the herring fishery opened, um, closed down the shops in downtown Sitka, and I think at least I'm optimistic that one day we're going to see signs like this in Puerto Rico again. Thanks.